introduction, I'm going to give you a little bit of an exploration into my thinking when it comes to nutrition, when it comes to health, um, and the concepts that I've been ruminating over with over the last 10 years of being a professional in this field. And, and the more I get deeper into this and the more connective dots come together in the constellation of all the different things I'm working with, the more interesting it becomes. And the more interesting this conversation around health becomes. And so one of the things that is really inspiring to me is using health and nutrition and um, certain technologies that are in alignment with where we're going as a species, at least where we want to be going. There's something about that that goes beyond common conversations around health, right? Who here is like, feels like you've tried every like diet, you've tried so many different health approaches, you've read tons of books, which by the way, most of the books you find on nutrition are exactly the same thing. I've figured this out over the years. I, whenever I go to Barnes & Noble or I go and look at the bookshelf, I notice something. It's just almost the same thing reconfigurated, recontextualized, recongealed into a different program, right? Just the, the main differences are like vegan, vegetarian, raw food, paleo, um, complete obnoxious approaches like total standard American diet type of approaches that seem to have no bearing on reality or no bearing on actually a transition from what we've all been inundated with, which is, you know, the standard American diet and actually moving into something that's a little more natural, something that's a little more normal. It makes a little more sense, right? So after just really surveying what the, all the options out there that are being presented to people, I realized there's a reason why there's so much jaded energy around health and nutrition, you know? And, and when I come and talk about it, I've really done a lot of work on myself and my approach and my perspective to come from a place of neutrality and I'm not here to tell you, like, you need to be on any particular diet or, or dogma or anything like that. Actually, the beauty of all of this is that we live in the age of informational abundance, which is amazing once we really get that, because then once we take full responsibility for our health and for our life as a whole, we realize that we have incredible access points to the particular information that is most relevant and most most um, useful for us at any particular stage that we're in. Does that make sense? So, so my my intention is never really to like uh, impose upon my values. I'll tell you my values as they are now, but that doesn't mean that you have to adopt my values. In fact, like we actually, I'd really encourage all of us to tune in to really get a clear idea of what do I value. You know, what, what are our values in the first place? Because our values are wrapped up in our lifestyle choices. You know, a lot of people, a lot of us at different times, we adopt the values of mentors. We adopt the values of, of gurus or other authoritative figures and try to try to fit ourselves into their value system. It never quite works, does it? There's always like this inner conflict. There's always this, this feeling of tension. Something's not quite right. And I found out over the years that my particular strategy with nutrition is a reflection of my value system. And my particular approach to nutrition, actually, it actually either, um, what's, the, what's the way to say it? It either supports or does not support my values for the environment, my values for sentient life, you know, all those kind of things, my values for my health and for my well-being. And every time I'm making a choice, every time I'm putting something in my mouth, it's a conscious choice. It's never like by accident. Has anyone here ever eaten dinner by accident? <laughs> it's happened. Yeah. You know, like, for example, like probably everyone has the experience of watching TV or something and you like have a bag, you have a bag of cookies and you're trying to have one or two or three, but then 30 minutes later, the whole bag is gone. Has anyone had that experience? I mean, no one here, of course, but you know, somewhere over there, out there, <laughs> right? What is that? That's a departure from consciousness. 
And that's part of the whole system. That's part of the whole kind of program that's been set upon us is that we're actually using or I'm using nutrition. And my message is really about encouraging people to use health or health modalities as a strategy for freeing yourself, for liberating yourself from the program of society, from the program of mediocrity. There are certain foods that will support that liberation process. And there are certain foods or food like byproducts that will hold us hostage. Does that make sense? All right. I could go deeper down the rabbit hole on that at any particular time you wanna you wanna dive into all that and the implications. But today really what I want to do and use this time is really um, dive into a number of concepts relating to alchemical nutrition. And it's perfect timing to talk about this because I have a new book that's being released in a couple weeks called The Inner Alchemy Youthening Program. And this is an advanced copy my publisher just got to me before I came out here, which is perfect timing. And as I'm going through this, there's a lot of really interesting, interesting nuances and interesting ways that this conversation has gotten wove together. And I just want to kind of open up your minds to some of the primary subjects here that I think are of, of particular importance. My focus over the years, and especially my focus now, is about human potential. And I don't mean human potential like take this pill and everything's going to be better. Like take this nootropic and like everything's going to be solved, your brain fog's going to be gone, your, everything's going to come back online miraculously. Now, that can support the system, but that's not really where my thinking is. My thinking is about understanding the, the scientific principles of longevity. What has been figured out empirically? What do we know for sure about how this body actually um, sustains itself? And then what, what are the best theories that we have about where, where we're going? Some of the theories around fasting, some of the theories around living beyond 120. You know, that's not really my thinking either. Like, I'm not actually interested in how to live to 120. That's kind of like, that's kind of an old idea to me. I'm really interested in asking a different question. Like, how do we live to 200? If the immortal yogis could figure it out or the Taoist immortals could figure it out or certain subsects of people in different cultures that we're kind of hiding away from society, because that does appear to be one of the, the measurements for longevity, at least among the longest living and the happiest people in our, our modern world, not to mention just our ancient world, is um, seclusion and actually getting away from noise pollution, getting away from pollution of all kinds, right? And just actually having time for ourselves in nature's abundance. That's one of the main things. We'll, we'll dive more into that and in some of the more practical applications of that. But so that's where my thinking is whenever I talk about this kind of stuff is that I, I want to know what are the extents of human potential? And then how can we ask a different question? Again, instead of asking a question of like, how do we live to 120? Oh, we already figured that out. Next question. How do we live to 160? That's okay. That's, that's cool. How do we live to 200? How do we live to 250? I believe there, there have been beings on this planet that have cracked that code. There have been beings on this planet that have cracked that code. And they get kind of nuanced in some of the literature. If you dive into Ayurveda long enough, you pick up this stuff. If you dive into the, 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 the ancient yogic texts, you pick this kind of stuff up. You dive into the Chinese medicine. Not really. Ch Chinese medicine is more new. More Taoist medicine is the original teachings of what we now call TCM. TCM is more of a medical model of the original Taoist Chinese te teachings, which is more based on the energy harmonics of the body and how our body runs energy. And then also how natural plants in a natural environment communicate to us so for example has anyone heard the term the doctrine of signatures okay so this is this is a fascinating point the doctrine of signatures is 
a model for identifying a plant. This can be used for an animal type of food or medicine as well. Um, but to identify an herb in its natural environment, to, to identify the shape of that, that herb or plant or whatever, to identify it by its smell, by its climatic re, re, uh, region, so where it's growing, what the climate is like, what the fluctuations of the climate's like, like maca root, for example, is the highest altitude crop in the world, in the Andes of Peru. And it actually, it's shown scientifically to increase respiratory health, to increase oxygenation in the respiratory system into the brain. And that's fascinating to me because in order to source the high altitude maca crops, farmers would actually have to go up they would have to exercise the respiratory system. It's kind of like the price you pay to play, right? It's like eating noni or something. Like there's a, there's kind of when you can, when you deal with the most powerful foods and herbs in the world, um, and you're getting it from a natural environment, there's a little bit of a price to pay. Um, to play, I should say. There's a price to play, which is something that strengthens you, and it tells you something about that that particular food or herb that you're actually procuring. Does that idea make sense? So this is natural wisdom. Herbalism is largely intuitive wisdom or wild food intuition is another way of saying it. And that's part of this process of really achieving vital states of true health, true everlasting vitality. It's not like take this supplement or take this pill and, and, and email me in the morning. That's like the pharmaceutical model of consciousness. That's the pharmaceutical and supplemental model that we've all been kind of raised with. By the way, most supplement companies are owned by, does anyone know? I don't know, Procter & Gamble or something? Big Pharma as a whole. So just to kind of give you a little bit of insight into that, that industry as a whole. Right, so my whole thing is like, okay, what if we get back to food first and we start tapping into our wild food intuition, which is largely why we're all here, you know, so we can start tapping into the natural intelligence of a natural environment and eat food that is mineral rich and contains the minerals and the microorganisms that come from the soil to reinform our biology. And reinform our genetics. Does anyone, has anyone here heard the term epigenetics? Okay, so we're familiar with that. So our our outside environment, our food, our relationships, being our emotional state, all that has a dramatic effect on our genetics generationally. So the epigenetic factors and the epigenetic switches appears to be one of the main measurement points for human potential from a physicality and, and you know neurological and microbiotic level all these things if anything goes over your head by the way let it just take in what comes into you if there's a term that I say that you don't quite understand just write it down the beauty of our world is that we can we can just google it you know we can just google anything which is something that the Taoists didn't have something that the immortal yogis did not have and that's what makes this whole doctrine of signatures idea so fascinating is that they didn't have GPS, they didn't have Google, they didn't have Wikipedia, they couldn't just Google it. You know what I mean? And that's what fascinates me. If, if our predecessors way back when tapped into their dormant Jedi-like superpowers, that must mean that we're capable of that too. And that also must mean genetically certain switches have been turned off, that have been turned inactive, right? Has anyone heard this idea of junk DNA? Has anyone not heard that? This is, this is where science gets a little comical to me. This is where some, well, you know, what is proposed to science anyways. It gets a little silly to me. So there's, there was this idea more and more materialistic, me mechanistic types of science, which is like the main model of science that we all grew up with, right? Material, this is all there is. This is all, this is the only game in town. Nothing else exists. Consciousness is just a byproduct of chemical reactions in your brain. Nothing exists. There's no afterlife. All that, right? That's kind of depressing. 
so there was an idea, um, I think Richard Dawkins was a massive proponent of this, which is basically that 98% of your DNA or your genes are, are junk. And the way that they came up with this, like a lot of scientific, um, uh, I'm failing to find the right word, but a lot of scientific theories or, or conclusions is the right word. A lot of the conclusions are based on not having an answer, an explanation, therefore they find one or make one up. It's like, okay, well, 98% of your genes basically have no viable function, therefore they must just be junk. Now, I don't know about any of you, but that never really made sense to me. Even as like even as like a teenager who basically skipped every science class I could because I, I just I don't know, I just was a rebel and all I cared about was was playing basketball and, and doing martial arts and I didn't really make the cross connection at the time that if I was gonna play professionally I actually had to get good grades. I know that never dawned on me, so I had to oh, I had to do a few extra makeup work. Um but even even at that age, I kind of I kind of knew some of these things. It's probably why something in me actually rebelled against a lot of it, because I kind of knew like, whoa, okay, some of these theories or some of these impositions, um, what I'm being told doesn't actually make sense when you actually think about it. And so what appears to be the case is that we have a whole a whole host of genetic sequences that have just been inactive. They're just laying dormant. And so when we're talking about healing, we're talking about transcending certain states of even consciousness, I look at it from the body first. You know, a lot of people in the spiritual community are really focused on transcending the body, or even transhumanism, as if the body has no inherent intelligence. And that, that too never really sat well with me because I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm incarnated in this body and I'm moving around. This thing appears to me to be some sort of avatar. And the more I got into conscious awareness and realized like, oh, you mean there is a soul? There's spirit? There's a force that animates all life? Okay. Then that must mean that this thing is like a vessel. It's like an avatar that my soul or me, however you want to kind of think of that, is carting around in this physical 3D dimension. And so that caused me, once I started to get clear on that, that caused me to relate with it differently, it being my body. Right, I started to actually care for it because I realized that it's a symbiotic relationship, right? And through the nervous system, we're able to interface with this tactile, sensational reality. And so this is really like leading, this, this, this conversation is really leading into the concepts of, of alchemy and like real alchemy. And what I mean by that is, is physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual alchemy as a unified pathway, as a unified conversation. There's a tendency in a lot of these, these circles to compartmentalize these ideas, like Oh, it's just alchemy of the soul, like, you know, like turning base metals into noble metals. That's actually a metaphor. That's not real. It's just a metaphor for spiritual ascension. And if you actually dive into the alchemical literature and start studying the preparations, you realize like, oh, wait a minute, not only is that totally not true, but it's both. And I'm going to connect. I'm going to connect the bigger part of this for you as we dive into this. An alchemist was a noble, or I should say, an alchemist had a noble intention, meaning that in their pursuit of the philosopher's stone, which is which is a, a substance or a, or a set of substances that would what would ennoble somebody and give them immortal life. Right? It would immortalize them in this big, so that was the theory anyways, right? So many, many people, all the way to Sir Isaac Newton, were trying to crack this code. They were trying to figure out the secrets of longevity and immortality, really. And what they, what they, there was a premise behind all alchemical preparations was that in order to actually complete the physical process, 
your consciousness or your your um, your emotional, mental, and spiritual state had to parallel that. Otherwise, the preparation or the technology would be out of harmony with with life force or with nature. Does that idea make sense? So, like nuclear technology is a pretty good example of how alchemy can go wrong and how technology can be abused. And every great scientist, by the way, from my studies anyways, actually um, every great like prodigy like scientist that I've ever kind of really looked into, they all had a noble intention, which is what gave their inventions life. Because they had a spiritual impulse that was guiding the manifestation of that, but it always gets hijacked. And they always are they always get kind of like talked into it under the guise of they're going to do something noble for the planet or their invention or their thing is going to be the thing that saves the planet. And it tends to always get hijacked. That seems to be the thing, right? So what I'm starting to realize in this whole conversation too, is that this whole conversation around alchemy, as it pertains to health, as it pertains to our innovative qualities, kind of where I'm going with this whole thing, is the ability to generate more innovation, more creativity. And do it from a noble place. Do it from a place that's in alignment with our highest values. Do it in a place that's in alignment with our vitality and our dreams and desires. And also have a little bit of common sense along the way. Right, because one of the things I find that's fascinating with this kind of connecting the dot of where I'm, where I'm going with all this is that we live in the age of abundance. Not only can we create an endless surplus of physical vitality, not only can we facilitate a surplus of mental, intellectual, and emotional creativity, we can also we can also self fund our own endeavors as well, and that's something you know in health circles. Why is that important? What's that have to do with health? Well, the frequency of prosperity has everything to do with health. In the generations before our father, our, our parents, their parents, their parents before you know coming up in the Great Depression and way back when, they didn't necessarily have the ability to create their own platform or to create their own uh, funding through the work that they do. And it's, it's come to my attention that if we, only, if we only allocate health towards food and exercise and, and yoga, there's a key aspect that's missing. And that key aspect to me is actually our dharma. It's our purpose on the planet. If there's one factor that I've identified, the longest living people in the world, I'm not talking about people that are decrepit and like cogity and like breaking down in their 90s or 100 or something, right? I'm talking about people that are robust, people that are vital, people that are happy, they're in harmony with their community, and they're actually innovative. They're still creating well into their, their hundreds. That factor seems to be being on your purpose being on your mission. That seems to be the number one anti-inflammatory. That seems to be the number one thing to heal, to heal all wounds. Is to actually identify what our purpose here, what is our mission? What is our path? Because once we line up with that, then something interesting starts to happen. We're no longer really guided by pain. We start to become guided by pleasure. We no longer start to focus on our weaknesses and trying to improve upon our weaknesses. That's the tendency, right? Like, oh, I got to work on my weaknesses. I got to fix this because I'm broken or I'm not good enough. I'm incomplete. So I got to gotta focus on my weaknesses. I've come to find that we don't actually have time to entertain our weaknesses. We have to actually focus on our strengths because in our strengths is where our mission is. In our gift, that's where our dharma is. So how this relates to health and nutrition for me is that I use I use that modality as an access point for human potential 
and for fulfillment. And what I've come to find is that <clears throat> when our body is breaking down, when we have aches and pains, we have brain fog, we have digestive disturbances, we have arthritis, whatever the case is, it's very challenging, if not impossible, to have an attitude of gratitude when we're in a state of such pain and disarray physically. Does anyone disagree with that? And we've all probably felt that, right? And I think that's why the, the health message is coming in so strongly in our world right now, because it, it's a message that needs, it needs more voices. It needs more people actually like acknowledging the fact that, hey, our health is important because it's also a part of how we value ourselves. It's a part of our self-worth, how we take care of ourselves. Heard a lot of you earlier talking about this idea of like, you know, creating more self-worth, more value, valuing ourselves more, supporting ourselves more, right? And so when we believe in ourselves, and when we actually believe that we're worthy of a mission to impact other people, to impact the world around us, we start to take better care of ourselves. Just a natural phenomenon. Imagine that, right? Something moves through us that propels us into playing a bigger game. And that bigger game usually has something to do with service. It usually has something to do with contribution. I don't think I've ever heard anyone who is honest, like talking about their dreams and desires, and it didn't have to do with like giving back. It didn't have to do with helping other people or helping the planet or helping animals or something like that, right? So actually this health message takes on a bigger point. It's not just us and being healthy and feeling good in our body. It's actually a necessity because, you know, like light workers worrying about their health is like, it's just kind of become ridiculous to me at this point. It's like, it just doesn't make sense. If you're here on the planet, to serve a bigger purpose and to be a beneficial presence on the planet, to be sidetracked with little aches and pains and, and physical issues, it's, it's a little silly to me at this point, just the whole situation. So that's why I think it's propelled me personally into helping lead this message forward. Because it's really for all of you. It's really for the people that are ready to step up and like actually help get the ship back on track. So the alchemy here, let's, let's move forward with this. Um, the alchemical process is really, it's, it's, it's called the transmutation or a transformation of one state of being to another state, right? The transmutation of your physical temple, right? You, we get that, right? Like our body is a temple. It's actually a temple. Like, is it a garbage bin? Like a junk food garbage bin. Is that what these bodies are designed for? No, right? It's a holy temple. It's a holy temple. So the first stage of this is what happens when we actually treat our physical vessel like a holy temple. And we align ourselves in congruency to that. And then we start to adopt, as we go through this, this process, we start to adopt a type of eating pattern or eating habits, if you will, eating strategy, nutritional strategy that lines up with our highest values. So for example, if we're wanting to lighten up, it's probably a decent idea to start lightening the load of what we put in our mouth, right? We start eating lighter food, water rich food. When I got into about almost 10 years ago, when I got into vegan and vegetarian diets, that changed a lot for me. That was a, I mean, all the, all the allergens for the most part started to remove themselves. I started to really feel a lot more sensitivity. I started to feel a lot more aliveness in my body and my emotional temperance was a lot better, I would say. And then when I got into living food and really got deep into that, um, everything turned on like a, like a million light switches. I mean, I had a nagging knee injury. I've had two knee surgeries as an athlete, and I had a nagging knee injury that I couldn't quite, I was working with some of the best um, 
physical therapists in the world. My surgeon was also the surgeon for the LA Lakers. And so I had some of the best people working with me, but there was a point where it just wasn't, it wasn't flowing quite right. There was like 80% was, was healed, but that extra 20% was still nagging at me. I had to ice my knees every single day, about two to three times a day, because I worked out two to three times a day, every single day. And I remember I would have to wrap these big ice packs around my knee, tape it, and lay down and watch like some documentary or, or a movie or something. So my life was basically dominated by working out. And then the extra time I had, I was mending, I was tending to my, my injury and just kind of maintaining it. When I got into living food, and I personally went on a 100% raw food diet, this all plant-based diet, all uncooked food, um, and green vegetable juices, and a few other things, like grounding. I got barefoot on the ground. I started to learn about that, the phenomena of grounding and earthing, and actually getting out of the rubber sole shoe that connects, that disconnects us or insulates us from our soul, being Mother Earth right? Because the rubber insulation, it disconnects us from the, the ionic charge of the earth, which apparently scientifically is the number one anti-inflammatory antioxidant ever discovered by science is the emanations that are coming from the earth. So getting barefoot on the earth, getting into an electrically conductive substance like water and getting that negative charge that actually, that, that is basically like it's charging you up. And that charge, by the way, another word for that charge is alkalinity. Just in case anyone's confused about acid, alkaline diets, all that kind of thing, we can go way deeper into that later. It's basically, there's three things that define that, but one of them is the, is the electric charge, a positive or, elect, or a negative charge. And negative is basically alkaline. Positive electric charge is basically acid. Just kind of, that, that, well, that might come in more a little later. But getting in submerging yourself into the living waters of our earth. And you'll notice when we go to the beach today, if you're feeling foggy, you're feeling tired or anything, you just jump in real quick, you get your body submerged instantly, it charges you back up. Has anyone had that experience? You're just like down and out. It's the worst ever. It's just like you, there's no hope for your day. You're just like out of it, you're, you're moody, whatever the case is, and you get this idea, you know what, I'm just going to go to the ocean and see what happens. And you get in and it's like <laughs> baptism immediately, right? It's just like everything, it basically discharges all the dissonant frequencies that get imprinted on your biofield, right? The, the electric field that emanates from the physical body or surrounds it however that quite works, it gets chart, it gets imprint, all those frequencies get imprinted on our field and have to be displaced. They have to be pushed off. So grounding, getting into the ocean, getting connected with the earth, the trinity of the earth, that's, that's, that's paramount. Um, where am I going with that? So, so that's, so basically that, that's what I did. And within 30 days, I healed my knees completely. We're talking about seven years of nagging injuries. Within 30 days, my knees were completely healed. To the point, I, I might add, that it wasn't even that they were healed. My knees were healed. I was healed to a greater extent because I actually forgot that I was ever in pain, which is kind of like this is the bigger part of my message when it comes to healing is that at some point, you become healed. At some point, you don't actually have to tend to your wounds anymore. You don't have to maintain your healing process. At some point, you become healed. You either decide it or it just happens. One way or another, though, that's the, that, that's the evolutionary impulse is for our own healing and transcendence. So for me, what ended up happening was I was, I was healed to such an extent that I forgot that I was in pain. And mind you... I was an avid runner and I was scared to go on runs, like even a mile run for, you know, I'd run five miles every single morning for years. Then after that injury, I was like, Ooh, I don't know. I don't think I can do it. So I basically, for two years, I stopped doing like a lot of runs. And then one day I find myself driving to the hills, this, this hill that I grew up running, running up and down and everything. 
I found myself driving there and I went for a five mile run in the hills and I came back and something dawned on me. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. I started looking around. I started feeling my body like, wait a minute. I started bouncing up and down. And that was the moment everything changed. That was the moment theory became fact for me. That was the moment I think my destiny actually was handed to me in this particular field and the work I do now. It was just like this lightning bolt came through. I was like, wait a minute. I'm healed. 